Okay. So, okay, so let's, uh, so this last lecture, we're going to give some applications of of index theorem. Okay, so let's uh, now <clears throat> recall what we did. The proved two formulas, I mean, one of them we more or less proved it completely. Of course, there are so many details that still have to be uh, you know, done, but uh, essentially, so the gist of the argument that index of d plus is equal to integral a hat of pm over m. So this is this a hat genus. And uh, what is a hat genus? I mean, uh, so you can recall that for any real vector bundle, so this is about genus. Definition, I mean, uh, because we, we defined it like a few weeks ago. So maybe, so let me recall what was the definition for any real vector bundle. And say, So this is a real vector bundle. Then uh, we define this a hat of uh, this as uh, to be um, basically uh, the determinant of uh, this expression uh, all over four pi over sine hyperbolic of r over four pi, and then we have to square root it, okay? Where R is the basically curvature matrix of two forms. Uh, so this is for a uh, connection on any, we, we prove that this is independent of choice of connections. Uh, its class uh, is independent of choice for any connection. So this was so. This is a general idea of a hat genus for 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 vector bundles, and then we applied it to TM. You get this. So this was uh, at TSC. Uh, for Dirac. Of course, in this case, uh, M was uh, <clears throat> just uh, spin with an infinite one, spin even dimensional with an infinite. I mean, of course, it has to be closed. Uh, Means it's compact without boundary and uh, this sort of things, but that's okay. The, the conditions we, we wrote down explicitly and exactly in last lecture. So this was the first case. And the second case, uh, I mean, this is pretty good, but that's not enough because uh, it's only, after all, for a spin bundle. Uh, I mean, uh, it's just a Dirac operator on the spin bundles. We need uh, more general bundles in order to be able to apply it to many cases. I mean, uh, for any Hermitian vector bundle, uh, so we, we called it V on M. We notice that they can just tensor the bundle of spinners with, with V and create a larger, bigger bundle, and then it has its own Dirac operator also. Uh, there exists 
a generalized Dirac operator. AB. So this goes from uh, C infinity of, say, uh, S tensor B. Um, spinners with coefficients in this uh, bundle to again there. Uh, this is also self-adjoint and you decompose it like previous case and then we get index of um, dv plus we got the second formula which is uh, integral of m toward m a hat of tm uh, I mean you have to wedge this with cherry character of uh, e okay so in this case uh, this bundle uh, oh v sorry this bundle uh, shows its presence in this case because we are twisting the Dirac operator with coefficients in this bundle. So this is a more complicated case. Remember, this was defined, dv was defined as d tensor one plus one tensor nabla. The nabla is a compatible connection on V. So this is the way we define this Dirac operator on this more complicated bundle. This is called the uh, Dirac operator with coefficients in V or twisted Dirac operator. And so this twisting creates uh, this factor here, churn character. And remember that uh, churn character of V, it was, uh, remember the formula for churn character, that was trace of exponential of R over two pi R. Trace of exponential of minus, it was not R, I mean, I don't use R in here, I just use F maybe f over 2 pi i, where this f is um, also curvature matrix of E of this point. f is equal to curvature uh, matrix of two forms again. Matrix of um, Matrix of uh, nabla, I mean, curvature matrix of E, now of B, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so this is the, this is a general idea of churn character, uh, but then so you have to copy it, or you have to wedge it with uh, a hat class. Uh, this is uh, not homogeneous, this is not homogeneous, so when you multiply, you get lots of uh, terms, and you have to pick the term of right degree, which is the top degree. That's the only term you can integrate. The other ones you just drop. And that's the... So these are these two formulas uh, for um, generalized Dirac operator and original Dirac operator. These are the Atiyah Singer in these cases. So this is Atiyah Singer for twisted Dirac for generalized Dirac. So now the plan for today is to use this, uh, this result, the second result, which is more general, to see that, uh, at least in some form, to see that um, they lead to some classical results of uh, uh, geometric analysis uh, and topology, basically. Okay, so let's see now. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is uh, we want to apply all this to see what it has to do with Gaussian nature. Okay. So application one. Um, I mean, this is really churn Gaussian. Uh, 
Um, so in this case, M is a closed uh, two M dimensional even uh, Riemannian manifold. So this one uh, now, um, okay, so now uh, the, the theorem of this um, of proof by churn, actually it was proved by, uh, by Bay and uh, some other daughter and other guys, but uh, churn gave a very nice intrinsic uh, a beautiful proof that opened uh, the way for a lot of developments in characteristic classes. So, turn goes from A to R. Um, it says the following it says that all the characteristic of M is equal to one over two pi power M integral over M phi M of um, maybe omega. So um, this is Euler characteristic. And this state is phi M, as you remember, uh, we defined. And this is curvature matrix. Curvature matrix. I mean, you have this Riemannian uh, metric, for example, you can take the levi uh, connection, and that has a curvature matrix. And uh, so it's a matrix of 2M, two forms, 2m two by 2m matrix of two forms, and like the usual. So the question is, what is Fafian? Uh, also recall that we defined uh, Fafian. It was basically from skew symmetric 2m uh, two by 2m two matrices, right? Uh, skew symmetric, I mean, this was like, uh, um, uh, so n s o two m uh, of r or could be c it doesn't matter to uh, r so this is a skew symmetric two uh, m by two m matrices and this half m uh, of the matrix was defined like this. Uh, you remember the formula, it was, uh, the formula was very much like determinant, but it's a square root of the determinant. So you have to take a square root, but okay, it's an algebraic function. So this is sum um, minus one to sine of sigma, sigma belonging to uh, S2M. Uh, then you have uh, A, um, a, uh, Okay, uh, what should we put here? We should put uh, sigma by one, sigma by two, a sigma by three. Uh, I mean, these are commas. Uh, sigma, maybe I just put sigma one, sorry. Sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, sigma four, a sigma two and minus one, sigma two m. So you take, uh, it should be two m actually, sorry. So you take a permutation in this uh, symmetric group of order two m, and you permute, you see in the case of uh, determinant, you permuted only one index. It was like a one, sigma one, a two, sigma two, and here you have you are permuting all indices, 
and this is uh, uh, Fafian. Uh, so now the crucial property of Fafian, of course, was that it's a square root of determinant of A. This is the crucial property. And you use this uh, expression, you apply this to this skew-symmetric matrix of two forms. So you do get, in this case, a two and four, right? Two and four. Uh, because this is a polynomial of degree m. There are only m terms are multiplied each time. It's not a polynomial of degree 2m, which the determinant would be. And it has to be like that because coffee and squared is degree 2m. So this is anyhow, this is the term, right? And of course, Euler characteristic. I am is sum, is this alternating sum? Bi, yeah, these Betty numbers. This Bi is a dimension of the wrong group of degree i of m. So alternating sums of dimensions of cohomology groups. So it took a long time to find this theorem because uh, this expression, so of course, you know, there is a simple case of this, so-called simple case, which was done essentially that's um, in some form, locally it was done by Gauss and uh, Bonnet is not very relevant here, but his name is there. But then another guy globalized it to the general case. So let me put it for m equal to one. The theorem says that Euler characteristic of m is equal to one over two pi. And in this case, this expression is just a Gauss curvature. It turns out to be just Gauss curvature. So this is equal to k dA. I mean, this is the Gauss curvature times the volume form of the manifold, of course, because this is a form. So we get KDA, right? So this is uh, the classical Gauss Bonnet, you know, as I mentioned several times. This is a classical, classic 2D Gauss Bonnet. For a, uh, for a closed uh, oriented surface like that. So we have this. So the expression in this case is very simple. It's just a scalar curvature uh, in the two dimensional case. But if you go to four and six and higher, the expression is extremely complicated. These sort of components appear. So that's the general form. Now, uh, what uh, Atiyah Singh uh, showed, uh, they showed that actually this is a consequence of their theorem. It follows from the theorem. So um, let me now uh, mention, first of all, Euler characteristic is an index. That's the first thing we have to notice. Uh, Euler characteristic. is an index, first of all. So index of what? So the idea now is this. Remember, uh, we have this operator G star, remember, uh, that goes from omega p of m to omega p minus one of m for all p. This is the adjoint of t, right? So if you look at d plus d star, this goes from dx sum omega p of m, p bigger than or equal to zero to itself. Okay, so of course this operator is self-adjoint. 
going from this space to itself. So it has no index. But uh, if you look at the half of it, if you decompose, then we get another operator, which I still denoted by t plus t star, that goes from now direct sum of omega 2p of m to direct sum omega 2p plus 1 of m. So this goes from even forms to odd forms. And actually, in the uh, first question, so in first lecture, maybe second lecture, we saw that actually index of this operator, if you calculate dimensional care and co of this guy. So this is like D. I mean, it's actually like DB. And this is like DB uh, plus, it turns out. Um, so, uh, so uh, check, uh, so we use Hodge theory. Uh, shows that, immediately shows that the uh, index of this d plus d star, uh, let's call this omega even, omega odd, is equal to order characteristic of that. So uh, the Hodge theory was the statement that, remember, it was the statement that said harmonic P forms on M, this is isomorphic to uh, Durham cohomology of order P, of degree P of M, right? So this is HP Durham of M. And the map here was, is, is a very simple map, it's just sense a harmonic form to its class there. Because a harmonic form means Laplacian on this guy is equal to zero. This is if and only if uh, d of omega equal to d star of omega is equal to zero. So a form is harmonic is in the character of Laplacian if and only it's killed by d and by d star. And using uh, things, uh, so this is the now. This is a big statement. This is one big consequence of this Hodge decomposition theorem. But you can remember it even like this. That's also good enough. That any uh, cohomology class, the wrong class here, has a representative in terms of uh, harmonic forms. There's a unique harmonic form of degree p that represents this class. Because a class can have many, many representatives. You can change it by D or something, right, by, by Coban. But uh, if you restrict to harmonics, there's a unique one, and that's that. So this is, so you can use this as other than as, as I showed in the first lecture, more or less, that the index of this operator uh, is equal. So what, um, what uh, Atiyah Singer showed in their first paper, or they realized, must have realized immediately, is that this is actually this operator d plus d star is really dv plus from, um, from uh, omega even. Omega odd. I mean, we have to complexify maybe, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't. If you complexify, it doesn't change the index. And uh, so this one, you see, uh, this is S tensor. Uh, so okay. So let's assume that this guy is a spin for the moment. This is the, this is like S tensor uh, again wedge star of. Um, uh, no, not a star. I need to. Um, uh, okay, so I need to say 
if I take spinors, tensor, spinors perhaps, yeah, this would be the bundle in this case to, I mean, plus I take S tensor, S star, and minus. So assuming that your manifold is a spin, you have this spin bundle, you tensor it, so this is your V. You tensor it by this V and uh, you get uh, this bundle. It's a calculation, you have to do that. It's a calculation. It's basically, this means that uh, this Clifford uh, module, you know, Clifford algebra of TM is, I mean, as, as an algebra, as, as a vector space is isomorphic to you know, basic star TM, but uh, okay, so let me not get into that. But then uh, the, the, the interesting or, um, uh, part of the calculation is to do, to, to show that actually, in this case, uh, that in fact, a hat M, which uh, chain character of this, In this case, that actually turns out to be exactly equal to one over two pi m. Uh, this uh, well, yeah. so this is uh, this has to do. So this is a bit uh, strange if you look at it because this is just this algebraic expression here. We have got is determinant of this x over sine hyperbolic of x square root. And then here, this is exponential of another term. So the fact that this wedge product is equal to that, this is not a trivial calculation, but it's not so bad either. So this is what they did. And as a result, uh, so the corollary was that they showed that yes, the index theorem implies So you can read again uh, about this in Rose book or, 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 or other books. Uh, there's a, it's a one page calculation uh, you have to do. So I, because I want to finish today and then I have, I have to talk about other things. So I won't go through this calculation. Any questions for now? Um, maybe could you explain the coefficient v? What, what, how does that... Yeah, that's right. So the coefficient v is this uh, bundle of spinors again. So we just take two copies of s. The other one is the dual. Is a star because um, first we assume that the manifold is spin. But then there is an argument that shows that you don't even have to assume your manifold is a spin. So there is a little bit of, but let's forget that. Let's just focus on the case that S spin. So in this case, S tensor S star turns out to be uh, this register star of TM basically. So we can forget about that. It's this one. So this is the spin bundle, bundle of spinos over the manifold. Yeah. So, I mean, um, the, the, the other case is just a Dirac operator, which is not strong enough for, for bundle of the spinners to, to give this result. Because this operator is even not on the same bundle. This is a, on a different bundle. It's a bundle of forms, full forms. So that's a different. Yeah. So that's the twist thing in this case. Yeah. Um, just uh, to give you a sense of this uh, higher dimensional case, just one easy case that you can check actually the result is correct is uh, the following. Uh, let me give. Um,
Okay, so, so here's an example. So let's take M equal to um, um, that's uh, R N over Z N. I mean, we, we are only interested in case N equal to two N is even. Uh, as we discussed, but actually, in, in the, a lot of things we do, we just do for this torus, it works in general. So let's just keep it general if you want. Okay, so that's the torus. Now, what is Euler characteristic of torus? Do you remember the Euler characteristic of torus by any chance? Well, we have to compute dimensions of homology, right? According to our definition. Right? Do you know what is bi? Do you know this dimension? You can uh, use any sort of algebraic topology calculations you have seen. That's okay. They're, they're going to be the same as this one. Uh, uh, Z, Z square, and Z, right? Sorry? Homologies. The Z homologies are going to be like Z, Z square, and Z. Or I mean, if, okay, since you're doing the RAM, it's going to be um, one, two, and one. Right? Uh, yeah, but this is uh, n dimensional, though. Oh, you're talking about the n dimensional torus. Oh. Then um, it's going to be, I think, something like n choose r. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. This is n choose r. Yes. Exactly. It's a binomial coefficient, actually. And in fact, uh, you can write even a basis for this Doron forms. The basis for this Doron forms is uh, very easy to write down. So, basis. For uh, this uh, hi, in this case is uh, dxi1, which, oh, the notation is uh, maybe I'll just choose k, sorry. Uh, so for hk, you said i1 base dx ik, i1 less than i2 less than ik, right? So Yes, indeed, if you take all of these things, they, they are globally defined one forms because they are induced from the top space, Rn, from the universal cover, they induce these forms on the, on, on, on the quotient, and you have all of them. So, so this is, uh, this are, that, that's a basis. You can check that these are basis. Okay. And then the, how many of them there are in choose K because there are in choose K of such things. Let's then equal to N. Okay, so then this is equal to sum minus one to the i. Okay, let me write it. N choose i over i. Well, of course, this is one minus one to the power n equal to zero. Okay, so all your characteristic for any n, even or odd, is zero. So pi to n in particular is equal to zero. Uh, I mean, this is what you checked it for any n, but here I need. It. So uh, let's check this against uh, Gauss for n. What, what does Gauss for n would say? Gauss for n would say that uh, the Euler characteristic. Oh, this is awful. I'm sorry. The other characteristic of T to M is equal to one over two pi to the power M. And then you have got integral over M. Okay, so far M of omega. So how can you check it in this case? So we want to check without assuming the theorem, we want to check. We check left hand side and we want to check the right hand side. We want to check that actually in this case, this is true. How do we do that? There's a flat connection on the torus. 
Yes. There is a flat connection, exactly, yeah. Because there is a flat metric here. I mean, the Euclidean metric is flat. So it induces a metric here. And if you take the connection of that metric, the Vichita, it's flat. So, so omega actually is identically zero for flat connections, of course, always. So if your uh, manifold admits a flat connection, in this case it does, this is zero, so it predicts this to be zero, so this is the case. So that's a, that's a very easy uh, check, but it's kind of good to do that. Of course, uh, for the case of uh, sphere also, you can check. Um, Checking for a sphere could be more interesting, actually, because um, um, uh, for n equal to s to n spheres. So what is the characteristic of n? It's equal to um, some minus one to i d i thing, but in this case, there is only Zero dimensional cohomology and top cohomology, and in the bit in between, they are all zero. All other cohomology groups are zero, right? So this is equal to one plus one, this is two. So then you want to check that two is equal to one over two pi to the power n integral of uh, phi and of omega over s2. Now, this uh, thing uh, is very interesting in this case because this form is uh, what? This form is a 2M form, right? On, uh, on uh, S2M, that's by definition. Uh, now, if you, how can we possibly check this result? Because this is a very uh, explicit prediction. Two has to be equal to that. So we have to compute this. How can we compute this uh, form on the right hand side? Well, you can choose because the metric that you choose, I mean, you have the freedom to choose the metric. Like in the case of Taurus, we could have chosen a crazy metric. Then in, in that case, we wouldn't be able to. But because we know that the result is independent of choice of metric, so we chose a flat metric which was available. And then in this case, of course, there is no flat metric on, on, on the sphere. We know that. I mean, even this result also itself shows that because on, the, on, one, on one side, it has to be two, so there can't be a flat metric. So how can we check that? There is something which is uh, next uh, to best thing in this case, which would be a round metric. You can just choose round metric. So this round metric is uh, as the full symmetry of the sphere. So it means that its curvature tensor is totally symmetric with respect to rotations of the sphere. So what does it mean? It means that this guy is SO, actually O to M invariant. Then uh, you have another uh, O2M invariant form, which is the volume form. So it, so it follows that phi n of omega it must be equal to some constant, the volume form. So C is a constant. C is a constant. Okay. So all you have to do, you have to find this constant. So what is this constant? See, in general, we know that, of course, any two M forms are related by function. But in this case, because of symmetry of the thing, if they match at one point, they're going to match at other points with, with the same constant. It's the symmetry argument they're using. Okay. So this constant, you can find it by doing the, you have to go into local coordinates at some point. 
I don't think there's a way around it. So if you just go to like projecting from North Pole, maybe something like that, or actually South Pole in this case is better, whatever, it doesn't matter, North Pole. You just uh, compute this constant. And then you are in, uh, once you, you compute the constant, you notice that this constant is actually equal to two times two pi to the power of n. So if you integrate this, um, uh, okay, so, um, oh, no, 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 I, I cannot say that. Then we get, you have to check y2. So this was the question. y2 is equal to one over two pi to the power m integral of c times d volume uh, of uh, uh, s2m over s2. Okay, so it follows that then c is equal to So you have to show that this C is actually, you can drive it here, is equal to two times two pi M over a volume of sphere of dimension two M with respect to the round, round metric, total volume of a sphere. This number is calculated. You, you know this number. Uh, so you have a, you're in principle, you have a way of checking this. However, you have to go into this local coordinate to find C any. So after you choose that local coordinate, you can check this. Of course, the case of uh, dimension equal to, uh, N equal to one is very easy. You don't have to do anything because we know what this half is, right? M is equal to one for S2, uh, known that this Raphian actually of omega is equal to KD and uh, A. This is the area form, which is the volume form for S2, right? So in that case, you are checking, you want to check that two is equal to one over two pi integral uh, k dA over s2, but this ground scale which is one. So this is equal to, so this is the question, two is, so that's the question, is two equal to one over two pi? And then this would be the area of a two, which is four pi r squared, right? So four, pi r is one, so, so they cancel they match. So for the case m equal to one, checking Gauss uh, one is easy. Of course, we use the fact that Falcon is equal to KDA. And that, I think I showed it actually. This has to do with the fact that Falcon of a two by two matrix is equal to A. Because the curvature matrix is a two by two symmetric matrix. Here there is this uh, Gauss curvature, and here is this Gauss. Okay, so still you have to use this fact, but yeah, but this uh, is a standard thing I, I, I did for popping places. Okay, so anyhow, in some cases you can check this by hand, but in general, it's a very, very deep theorem. The Gauss matrix. All right, so any questions? Okay, so let's look at, uh, so this was a very classic case. Um, uh, let's look at So this uh, churn gauss one by the way, was done churn gauss one I believe was done in 1943 uh, and before. 
but then uh, there is a more modern result, which is his work signature theorem, which I'm going to discuss now. Here's a work signature theorem. So this was done by Hilsenburg, I believe, around 1954, five or something. So this was a, this is a much more modern theorem compared to this one. So what is this result? Uh, the result is the following. Here is uh, that M be uh, closed oriented um, manifold of dimension um, multiple of four. So we just get the dimension. So this manifold actually doesn't have to be a smooth. It can be just um, topological manifold uh, without being smooth, but uh, closed uh, is important. So there is this uh, intersection pairing Uh, which goes from middle cohomology from M plus H to K wrong M to R, which works like this. If you have two forms, uh, alpha and beta, this pair is sent to integral alpha, wedge, beta, or you see this is 2K form. This is 2K form, you go into uh, 4K form and you integrate that 4K over 4K manifold over the fundamental cycle, so we get that. So um, yeah, this form, uh, this, this is called the intersection pairing or cup product pairing. Um, okay, this pairing, uh, because of properties of edge product, it's uh, symmetric in this case, because if you switch these two things, because this is an even form, uh, the other one is also even, so this order doesn't matter in the wedge form. Okay. So it's a symmetric non-degenerate bilinear form. Uh, so symmetric, as I said, easy. Bilinearity is easy. Why is it non-degenerate? Well, non-degeneracy follows from Poincaré duality. This is uh, actually the Poincaré theory in that case. This is really the Poincaré theory. So Poincaré duality. In general, we know that there is something from HP of M plus HQ of M to R for oriented uh, compact manifold. This uh, sends uh, alpha beta, sends into alpha wedge beta, but P plus Q is equal to N dimension of manifold. We know that this is a non-degenerate theory. This is Poincaré duality. The statement of Poincaré duality is that this is a non-degenerate theory. So in this case, it's a special case, so this is non-degenerate. Okay, so then if you have a real vector space and a non degenerate symmetric uh, bilinear form, well, if it is symmetric, doesn't have to be even non degenerate, you can always write it in kind of a standard form. So you, you can diagonalize it basically. So diagonalize, diagonalize. form, I mean, in that, in, so there is, there always exists a basis. In that basis, the form looks like some positive terms, some negative terms, and then uh, there could be some zeros, but in this case, there are no zeros because the form is non-degenerate. So 
So, so then uh, there is a invariant attached to this form called index of uh, this form. So, in a uh, well, signature. form is equal to a number of plus minus number of negative. You see, it's it's not a matrix, it's not a linear operator, it's a bilinear form. So you cannot talk about its eigenvalues. It's meaningless to talk about its eigenvalues because it's a symmetric form, it's not a, it's not a linear transformation. Conceptually, they are different, but uh, you can always choose a basis where here there are positives and here there are negatives, and this could be done arranged to be even one, 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 and minus one, minus one over real numbers. That's always possible for these quadratic forms. So this number is very important. It's called signature. So then you apply this idea in this case. So you define signature of manifold. So this is the definition. Of signature of M. So this signature of M is equal to uh, signature of this intersection pairing. Pairing. H. I'm in a homology. Um, actually, for this, you don't, as I said, you don't even need to have a smooth structure. You can do this for uh, singular homology or cohomology, actually, it's better to do cohomology. There may be some torsion, but you just kill the torsion and you look at the free abelian part of that group and then you define your. So you're basically from some z to some power. So this is the symmetry. So uh, now you knew uh, all your characteristics, right? So this is a kind of second numerical invariant now you see for to, to attach to manifolds, which is defined in a kind of very strange way like this. Uh, it's not alternating sums of some, some stuff. So this is a more subtle invariant, the signature. Um, okay, let me give one example at least, uh, or maybe a couple of examples of this signature. Well, the simplest case of four dimensional, because I mean, you have to work in four dimensional case, right? Because it's multiple of four. The simplest case of four dimensional things you can consider is. Would be um, m equal to a score. Well, in this case, things are very easy because of what? Because uh, we have that h two is equal to zero. <laughs> so there's no middle cohomology. So the problem is solved. Signature is zero. As as a kind of we are talking about signature of this. Quadratic form, which is zero on the zero dimensional vector space. So, this is a bit our discussions, like our discussions about zero dimensional vector spaces. So, you have to make your minds about that. But okay, so this is zero signature of the score equal to zero. Actually, you can check that signature of uh, by the same by the same argument, signature of S4K. Is equal to zero because h to k is equal to zero. So, right. Uh, okay, so that's good. But what about maybe torus? Maybe four k dimensional torus. Maybe just t four. Well, in that case, of course, H2 is not zero. Uh, T4, sorry, because we did it. Uh, that's, uh, that has a basis consisting of uh, 
six elements, so right? this is a six dimensional space. Fortunes two is six. So this is dx one, base dx two. So let me write all basis elements. There is dx one, base dx three. There is dx one, base dx four. There is dx two, base dx three, dx two, base dx four, and finally dx three, base dx four. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is a basis for this uh, space. So now we have to find the intersection there. Right? So the question now is we have to find. Uh, this pairing H2 Durand four plus H2 Durand D4 to R. So we have to find this pairing and we have to compute the index of this uh, quadratic form in this case, see what happens, right? Okay, so the recipe is clear. We just take this basis elements, wedge them, and integrate over the whole manifold and see if you get something meaningful in this case. So if you take, for example, dx1, wedge dx2, if you wedge this with any basis element that has a dx1 or dx2 in it, you're going to get zero, right? Because of this. So the only way you're going to get something non-zero would be to wedge this with dx3 wedge dx4, right? That's the only way they can get this. Okay, so if you, if you wedge this and you integrate this over t4, uh, we, we, we assume that this is a kind of orientation form. We have to make some convention about orientation, right? So let's assume that this is our orientation. So I declare this to be one, or positive would be like a volume of the torus with respect to the metric. It doesn't matter. So we can just declare it to be one. But once you have fixed this to be one, everything else is out of your control. Now let's look at, uh, so how many things we have? So this is the only way we can just take uh, one. Um, okay, DX, okay, now let's look at this. Dx1, which dx3. Then in this case, we have to wedge this. The only thing is dx2, wedge dx4. And we have to integrate. Okay, so we have to switch the things here. So you see, you get minus one. You get minus one. So let's go to the next case. Maybe this one now, dx1, wedge dx4. And then the only thing that gives me non-zero would be dx2, wedge dx3. Okay, you have to integrate. Okay, so this we have to switch once, and then we switch another time, so this is plus one. Okay, if you carry these calculations, you see that in three cases you get plus one, in three cases you get minus one. <laughs> so the matrix then is, One, 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 minus one, minus one, minus one, zero, zero. So the signature is equal to zero. But this was not obvious from the beginning. We have to do the calculation. Uh, a good exercise in this case is to check that signature of T4K is also zero. So I'm going to give this as an exercise. Check. So exercise. Signature of T four K. So 
you may think that uh, every manifold we have considered so far is signature is zero. Of course, we haven't considered every manifold. We just consider two very simplest possible manifolds. Um, uh, so signature of, for example, CP2, complex projective plane. This complex projective plane, um, its uh, signature is one, I believe. You see, this is a four dimensional, this is a two dimensional complex manifold. So it's a four dimensional real manifold, it's compact. And of course, it's oriented as a natural orientation also. So why this signature is one, um, there is a two dimensional cycle which would be embedding of CP1 into this CP2. I believe if you take the intersection of these two, this should give you positive uh, things. So, okay, so this, this needs a calculation. I, I don't, so this, this, let's take it as a fact. So you can calculate this and it should not be difficult to do. So, uh, before I take a quick break, maybe I'll just uh, uh, say something then. Um, okay, so now we have this thing about signature, so what? Well, the thing about signature is that Hilsebrook proved an amazing theorem about them. So, a little bit like Gauss Bonnet, but uh, it, it's a different thing. So this is Hilsebrook. Signature theorem. As I said, this was, I believe, 1954, but maybe 55 or 53 around that time. So what is this signature theorem? Uh, the signature theorem says that uh, there exists universal polynomials Ln such that signature, okay, I mean n is a 4 dimensional, 4k dimensional, da da da, signature of m is equal to integral Ln of p1 to um, p n over n, where dimension of n is equal to 4n. Okay, first of all, there are these universal polynomials in n variables for all n, n equal to 1, 2, 3, so on, such that the signature can be computed by evaluating this, computing this, integrating this differential form of degree four n over n. Now, what are these p1, p2, pn's? These pi's are what we already defined in when we were discussing characteristic classes. So these are Pontryagin classes. So let me write it. Um, so, what is a Pontryagin class? Uh, well, the Pontryagin class is defined. You see, um, pi was c to i of, we just take the tangent bundle and we complexify it. So, we saw that if you take chain classes of complexifications of tangent bundles, um, uh, if, if you take odd chain classes, they vanish because of the skew-symmetry nature of the tensor. Uh, but in this case, uh, for, for even ones, you see a C, CI is a 2i4 chain classes. It's double the dimension from characteristic classes. So this was, that's it. Remember, this was a formula. So we call it from characteristic classes. Uh, 
Um, now, let me give you a kind of more uh, down to earth definition of contracting classes so that you understand what's going on, because that's a bit too abstract in a way. Although, I mean, we did this characteristic classes, Chern Bay theory, and everything is there. But let me give you an original definition. So, this is original, really contracting definition. Of the eyes. So what Pontryagin did was the following. He said that, okay, I have this manifold of dimension for n, or any n actually, doesn't matter. You can always embed this in some big uh, Euclidean space, embedded. You can always put your, you can always put your manifold inside embedded inside some big uh, higher dimensional Euclidean space, right? And then once you look at M inside this Rn, so this is a submanifold, then you can, so now let's see, imagine this is inside. Then there exists a map from M to Brassmannians of um, N planes in Rn. So this is this famous Grassmannian space. So this is the space of, this is the set of all n-dimensional subspaces of Rn. N dimensional. You just take all n dimensional subspaces of Rn and then uh, this is your. So, this is you can see if you just take one dimensional subspaces of Rn, this would be the projective space, the real projective space of dimension uh, n of dimension n minus one, <laughs> I should say. But this is a uh, Grassmannian, anyhow. So, what is this map? How can we define this map? This map is very easy to define. How do you, how, if you have a submanifold of Rn, how do you define a map from that submanifold into Grassmannians? Just take the tangent space. That's it. This is really Gauss map, essentially. That's it. So the idea actually goes back to Gauss. So this is the, let me just say Gauss map, generalized Gauss map. Just send m belonging to m to tangent space of m, m which is an m, n dimensional subspace of and so this belongs to G plus minus of m. Now you have two ambiguity here, right? First of all, which embedding you choose, and second of all, which n you choose. You might complain. There are two ambiguities but they don't matter. Up to homotopy, they are all the same. Then what uh, Pontryagin said, he said that, okay, I know cohomology of this, so if this map is like F, I can pull back cohomology here to cohomology classes there, right? So this is pull back. That gives you from cohomology of G uh, and R and say for and very very large so that it doesn't matter to H I of cohomologies of M. Now these cohomology groups have been calculated by people. Cohomology of Grassmannians have been calculated, and the way to calculate it is to use some cell decomposition. So you can actually like simplest case projective space, you can you can construct projective space by stacking together copies of Rn and Rn minus one, Rn minus two, and up to zero. So if you take one copies of point, one copies of line, one copies of R2, and you put them together in a special way, you, you can construct the projective space. This is a famous decomposition project. There is a similar decomposition, a little more involved. For gas minus, and this shows that these, these cohomologies only exist in dimension 4i, actually. 
multiples of four. They don't exist in other dimensions. So and these are some, there are some universal classes, let's call it PI, belonging to H4I of G. And what is PI then? For function ID classes, this is pullback of these PIs. So that was the idea of country again in, in, in 1940s, maybe 1941. Um, well, I can say it on 1941, I guess. Uh, so uh, you, you see uh, what, what they are now. So part of the task of chern Bay theory is to prove that the construction that we gave with characteristic with, with connection and curvature stuff is the same, gives you the same as this. So this, well, this needs a proof, but that's all. Right. It gives you a feeling for, for this thing anyway. Anyhow. So this is this uh, Pontryagin class. Sorry, the, the, the L polynomials. So let me give a special case of this now. Um, so the yes. cohomology is a Diham cohomology? Sorry? The cohomology here, is it Diham cohomology? Yeah, I mean, you can, exactly. I mean, you can work with Duran, for example. These are smooth, compact manifolds. Actually, they are analytic even, so that's better than this one. So yeah, you can take your own. But the construction is very general. You don't have to take your own. You can take integral cohomology because these cohomology classes are integral actually. And pull back and you can do better than the own. You can define integral cohomology. So this PI is actually, because remember this CI is where actually I proved that, I mean, I didn't prove, I said that they, they really exist as, as integral cohomologies. Of course, originally they defined it as Doran, but I said that they are actually integral. It's exactly because of this construction, similar construction. And PI also, I mean, this, was, this belongs to 2i integral and this belongs to 4i integral. Of course, you have to go back and forth between, you know, this integral cohomology is the most subtle, right? It's the most subtle. It's more subtle than Duran because it has torsion also. Duran kills the torsion, but uh, so these guys, so these guys are integral classes. But these LNs are not polynomials with integer coefficients. They have rational coefficients also. So let me tell you now. So for uh, dimension four, the result says that this is equal to integral over m one third of p one. That's this case, and the case of for dimension two, actually eight. Uh, we have uh, sigma m. Okay, do I remember the coefficients? There is one, some, some big numbers. I have to use my notes, sorry. There is some coefficients here, so, okay. Okay. Oh yeah, it's not very big, but it's not a uh, small either. One over 45 times 72 minus P1 squared. You see, this is a form of degree four. You square it, you get a form of degree eight. Here is a form of degree eight by itself. The sum of the two is a form of degree eight with these strange coefficients and one over 45. None of this can be changed. They're all there. Okay, and this is the signature. And amazingly, an integer comes out of this calculation. This is another surprising thing that the result is an integer because signature is an integer. Okay. Another amazing thing about this result is that 
these uh, PIs uh, basically, um, I mean, they really depend on the smooth structure of the manifold because we use the tangent bundle. These PIs depend on the smooth structure. But if you do this sort of combination of them, this result is independent of choice of the smooth structure. It's completely topological. I defined it at the beginning. So this is uh, this is another thing to think about. But the most amazing application of this result, let me tell you, most beautiful application. Uh, was done by Milnor in 1957. Milnor used this result and some other thoughts uh, to show that there are uh, spheres, uh, there are a smooth structure on the spheres that are not diffeomorphic to ordinary sphere. There exists smooth structures. On a sphere on a seven, not the chemotic. The standard smooth sphere. So, um, if I had one more lecture, I would have given it, but we don't have the lecture. So uh, I highly recommend you read it. So these are called exotic uh, seven spheres. They're called exotic spheres. Uh, I highly recommend you look up, uh, you can see this in many references. Uh, uh, it could be even, I, I believe it's in, could be in no stash of characteristic classes. Maybe it's there. Yeah. But you, you just just search this, there are zillions of articles about this. So this is, this was like a bombshell. I mean, when, when this was discovered that on a seven, um, this was the first case where there is, a, there is another smooth structure, which is not the few of it to usual standard smooth structure. Structure on itself. So, this is quite surprising. Okay. But uh, now, what I want to show before uh, we make a quick break is no, actually, write this statement and then I come back. So, this was done by Elena Tiersinger as a result of her work. I mean, they observed that uh, this signature of n is also index of an operator. <laughs> so the question is, which operator? So we have this. 4K dimensional manifold, right? And we have this, all this stuff. Uh, signature, you can define it using the standard cohomology. But then all of a sudden, this becomes index of an operator. And then they used the index theorem to prove that uh, the signature theorem of Hirzebrook is a consequence of index theorems. So I will come back in five minutes and then we'll take up from. So we need some break. So let's stop here now. So let's. Okay, so let's start again. So uh, yeah, so which operator? First of all, uh, recall we had this star. So this Hodge star sent the P form, remember, uh, to. Um, N minus P four. So N is dimensional. Of course, I mean to define this star, we had to use the orientation 
and the Riemannian metric on it both to define this system. Okay. So now the problem with the star was that, of course, star squared, I mean, is not in general identity. Um, but it, you, can, you can fix this issue by multiplying it by some number. So let's now uh, look at this going from complexified forms to complexified forms. Which just identity on, on this one. So uh, let's define epsilon now. Okay, so let me originally this is defined like that. Now let's define epsilon from complexified forms, which is, I mean, remember this was omega of Pm tensor C, right? To complexify n minus P forms. I mean, the only thing you have to do is you have to multiply by appropriate powers of i, i to the power n over 2 plus e times p minus 1 star. So this goes from omega p of n to omega p minus 1. Oh. Omega n minus p. I'm sorry. What do I have? It's nonsense. Omega n minus p. Okay. So this is a kind of better duality now. So you can check that epsilon squared is equal to identity, and this is an exercise. You see, we have you have checked before that. Um, Star squared is equal to some 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 coefficients here depending on p uh, plus minus one depending on p, but epsilon squared from that and this adjustment you get that epsilon squared is equal. To. So if, if dimension of n is equal to even, I believe. I mean here is even. What dimension of n? Okay, so then you can check that, of course, this um, now you can also check that um, indeed uh, B, um, so let B equal to D plus D star again, it's like D plus D star. Uh, but uh, you just check that this uh, anti commutes with this one. And uh, actually, as a result, it commutes with delta. But this delta, of course, is just d plus the star squared, right? If you apply this twice, you're going to get commutation instead of anti-commutation. So this is okay, so so far we haven't done anything. We just say just this definition and this easy verification. This is consequence of that. This is also easy. So now here is the uh, important thing. So uh, definition now that omega plus of n be equal to plus one eigenspace of epsilon. Now, I want to look at epsilon as going from direct sums of all forms to direct sums of all forms. From omega m, which is by definition direct sums of all omega pm, or p to itself, okay? So you decompose this complex with respect to this grading now. Not even on, not the usual even on. This is a different gradient, uh, you will see. And uh, omega minus, and this is minus one eigenspace of epsilon. So basically, then you have uh, omega n equal to omega plus n equal to omega minus n. Okay, so we have to complexify here, of course. 
So that's kind of interesting because it means that now we can decompose this Doron complex in a different way. Uh, and uh, with respect to this sort of decomposition, this operator uh, d plus d star now sends plus to minus and minus to plus because of this this relation. So and that's the that's the operator that they want. So this is called now signature operator. This is uh, d plus d star going from omega plus of m to omega minus. Okay, so it is like the case of uh, like the case of uh, Euler characteristic we did before, except now we have a different decomposition. So this is space is very different from the like sum of omega even ones, for example, that we had before. It's a different decomposition. Uh, so by the way, these are called self-dual forms and these are called anti-self-dual forms uh, in there's some terminology. Uh, now, uh, so the lemma, this was done by Atiyah Singer. This is an easy lemma, uh, but it's important. Is that actually the index of this d plus d star is equal to signature of the of the one? So be careful, of course, before we set index of plus d star before we said that is equal to all the characteristic of that and you might say how come this is the these numbers are very different but i mean this is on a different space here this is on this decomposition here on, on the original decomposition so we, we uh, don't be confused by this the, the, the notation for the operator is the same but it's it's done on a different space so so it's kernel and co-kernel are totally different Okay, so how do you prove this? So let me give you at least part of the proof because it's kind of interesting here. Uh, oops, sketch. Uh, let's look at the middle cohomology. You see, star, I mean, epsilon, sends omega 2n of n to omega 2n of n. You see dimension of n is 4n, we are assuming. Uh, maybe 2k, sorry. Dimension of n is 4k, right? Well, I mean, this is clear because of duality in the dimension, right? So, um, okay, so then, then we can decompose this. Um, H2K, I mean, um, of uh, 2M, uh, H2K the arm of M. This is uh, given by a space of harmonic forms. So I just write harmonic. Uh, 2k plus of n, dx sum harmonic 2k minus of n, because the full uh, Durand group is equal to the harmonic uh, forms of dimension 2k by Hodge theory. But then this is space we can decompose into two pieces and then. Uh, so now we have to compute uh, index of d plus d star now it's going from different pieces to different pieces so we have to compute index piece by piece right so let's 
restricted to this middle piece. So let's compute what is this. So over there, I claim that this is actually equal to, uh, let's compute it. You see, if you have some, uh, I mean, here we see epsilon of omega is equal to, you know, omega in this case. Here is epsilon of omega is equal to minus omega, right? So that's the, that's the thing. And epsilon, by the way, is equal to star. In this case, this is equal to star. So let's look at uh, this uh, inner product of uh, alpha. Or alpha belonging to this part. Well, this is equal to integral alpha veg star of alpha by definition. Remember, this is the way we define inner product on forms, between forms. This is the de definition. But uh, because we are over the positive thing, so this star is, and because epsilon is equal to a star, so this is equal to integral alpha veg alpha over n. But this is exactly the pairing, the Poincare pairing between alpha and alpha. Right? This is the Poincare pairing. of uh, between alpha and alpha. Okay. So, but this guy is an inner, this is a positive definite inner product and these classes are non-zero because it's a cohomology, but this is positive. So it follows that the Poincare pairing on H plus is totally positive. Right. So, the, so maybe this pairing, I, I don't know what to call it, maybe, um, P or something, uh, I mean, there's something, anyhow, that's okay. So this, so Poincare pairing, on, um, on uh, this part, or harm to K plus, it's positive, and if you uh, do this calculation now, if uh, this is equal to minus, you see, if this is star is equal to minus, so you put minus here, then you get this uh, to be positive, so but then the other will be negative. By the same argument, you show that on gray pairing on harm 2k plus one, I'm oh, sorry, harm 2k minus is negative. Okay, so we have got uh, this positive bonds and negative bonds and the difference is the exactly the index, right? Well, we are just thinking about this index. So, so this calculation shows that so far the index So, so far, we have shown that index of D plus D star it is restricted just to this middle cohomology. I mean, from um, yes, to itself, this to itself is equal to. Um, Um, number of positive minus number of negative eigenvalues. Then there is another component uh, to the calculation you have to do. You have to show that uh, this uh, this pairing is actually um, zero on the other parts on, on, on lower classes. So next, you show restricted to um, 
direct sums of H to, uh, so sorry, HL of M, direct sum of H L, N minus L of M for L less than N over two. So we just focus so far L equal to N over two. And in that case, there is only one, which is just the middle, but then if you go from the middle, you have two, one less than middle, the other one, so because this thing goes into it, it takes out. Here is zero. There's a symmetry, they cancel each other. So there is something that we have to check. So basically, I mean, this is essentially elementary. Uh, use, you have to use Hodge theory, which we did use already. So, okay, so some details left. Okay, so I, I don't, it's really time is running, so I don't want to. Okay, so then uh, the next step for Atiyasinger was to show that actually this here's a work signature theorem follows from the theorem. So this was then the, the theorem was that so that's our second application is that uh, signature of M is equal to index of plus the star. Uh, okay, so this is now actually equal to integral over m, ln of uh, p1, pn. Now I'm changing my notation. So because to be consistent with this notation, I have to use lk in this case. lk, uh, no, 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 ln is okay, pn. Uh, no, 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 lk, sorry. <laughs> so dimension of m, uh, is equal to 4k. Um, there is explicit formulas from for this, this form. So let me just write them down using characteristic classes. Um, so let me write it like this. Is LKs are computed for L from L genus So the L genus was this. Remember, we had this X over tangent hyperbolic of X. Which, I mean, there, there is an expansion, uh, right? So some k given equal to zero. Um, okay, two to the power of two k over two k factorial e to k x to k. So this is of the form one plus x two over two minus x four over forty five. So yeah, from here you can construct these LKs and you have the expressions in terms of those things. So yeah, I mean there is a there is a general procedure about this going about these characteristic classes, which you have to spend more time, really, you have to spend more time to get into detail. So there's some. Okay, so, so this big result of Hilsebrook came out of, uh, as a consequence of uh, index theorem. And, uh, but Hilsebrook has an had another result, which was, also turned out to be a consequence of uh, index theorem. So let me just write it and then finish. Any questions about this, by the way? This was a bit too fast at the end, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I do have a question. So yeah. 
how in this twisted Dirac construction, how does this different grading come in? How do we get that? Oh, different grading uh, gives you. Um, um, so if you assume your manifold is a spin, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I think it's the same, uh, the, the total space is the same as before, of course. D, D plus D star, you know, the, the total space, you see, you just get this um, manifold, I mean, sorry, the, the, the bundle is a star, you tensor it with S, it, with the spin bundle. And then uh, this epsilon gives you a different decomposition on that. So that's because the idea of um, generalized Dirac operator was that um, we had this V. Okay, so I'm trying to understand your question. So what is, so you're, you're asking how the twist, how epsilon forces a choice of V, is that? Well, yeah, so how do we get something different from Gauss Bonnet, Gauss Bonnet when we're, when I think we'd still be using S tensor S star? We are using S tensor star as the total space, but we are decomposing it in a different way now. So this dV plus is a different operator. Yeah, so is that a, a different grading chosen on S star or? Um, a different grading chosen on the whole, uh, the tensor product actually of the two, yeah. Um, I guess I have a related question as well. So you have this uh, TS Singer index theorem. How does it apply to this theorem? Like, is a is a different operator in that case? Like, is it, it, it applying? Is it using the the original index theorem to prove this, or is there something? completely aside. No, I mean, the, 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 uh, when I said this is a star, it's not totally right, actually. I think, you, I think that's, that's really like Luke's question, basically. It's, it forces you to choose um, a different a star. I mean, fiber-wise is the same, but um, inside the Clifford algebra, I believe the way you you split the Clifford algebra is forced by this different choice of epsilon in this case, because it's all about the splitting the Clifford algebra into, you see, there, there are different ways of splitting Clifford algebra and that forces, uh, the choice of epsilon forces different splitting. So a star is not really uh, the same as before. This V is not the same as before, yeah, right. So this, um, yeah, the, it, it's a detail that has to be worked out very carefully, I should say. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, so that's, uh, that's yeah, I mean, so I, I'm leaving some details because uh, now, but there is some uh, case, uh, another case which was very important. So basically we are, we are going through three applications. Uh, one was gauss Bonnet, if you remember. gauss Bonnet churn if you want. And the second one was the Hibsebrook signature. And now the third one is also Hibsebrook. So that's Hibsebrook uh, Raymond Rock. Because we have come so far, let me just at least spend 10 minutes explaining this because we started late anyhow. So just Quickly. So this was a result that was done by Hazelbrook also around uh, 1955 or 56, around that time, more or less at the same time that he did the signature. So this was this Hazelbrook Grimmer Rock. So what is that? Well, in this case, uh, 
that you have a complex manifold, actually compact, meaning in this case really closed complex manifold, And uh, so what is a complex manifold? The complex manifold definition is exactly like a smooth real manifold, except that the charts are with comparison is open subsets of CN, some open domains in CN, and change of coordinates are holomorphic. That's the only difference, okay? So that's basically, so EG, you can take M to be, for example, the most uh, kind of famous uh, complex manifolds, you can take Cn over some lattice. So these are complex tori. So this is a full lattice, this is compact and you can divide. Uh, another case is CPM, complex projective space. And, but the, the, there are many, many other examples. So this is, you have some idea of this complex manifold. Now, let us, so, you know, we, we are dealing with vector bundles over these things. Are. So let's fix a holomorphic vector bundle on M. Holomorphic vector bundle on M. So what is holomorphic? So, I mean, the holomorphic vector bundle is exactly, again, like the definition of usual vector bundle, except that the change of coordinates or transition functions are holomorphic function. And fibers are necessarily complex vector spaces. So that's uh, also a very natural definition of holomorphic vector bundle. I mean, uh, so examples of this, you can take for example, over the complex projective spaces, there is this line bundle. So there is this canonical line bundle. Or tautological line bundle. So because this is a space of one dimensional complex uh, lines in uh, C Cn plus one. So an element here is, is a complex line in Cn plus one. So the fiber of the bundle over that line is the line itself. <laughs> so that's why it's called tautological. So, and then of course you have, uh, you know, some, some bundles over Grassmannians, complex Grassmannians. Of n planes, complex n planes, and then you get that. So there are many, many examples of this, these gadgets. Okay, so that's good. Then what you can do, you can define this thing called arithmetic genus. Genus of E. So um, this is uh, maybe pi m and E, this is defined to be similar to the original uh, Euler characteristic, but is defined to be minus one to the I dimension of HI M. And uh, so let me write notation for E. Okay, I from zero of the dimension of so this is uh, a sheet. This is, I mean, there are many definitions of here in this, but this is a sheet of uh, sections, holomorphic sections of E. So this is sheet for holomorphic sections. Of e. So, I mean, here, I mean, if you have a, a small open set, say on, on M, this, the value of this sheet are holomorphic sections of E over M. And these are sheet cohomology groups, but then the, to, to get the idea of sheet cohomology, just remember the definition of check cohomology, for example. You cover your manifolds by 
small fine enough covered, and then you take combinatorial definition of the check. So this is a generalization of that concept. So if n is compact, these groups are all finite dimensional. You can show these spaces and this dimension over C, and this is this polymorphic uh, Euler characteristic or arithmetic genus. So these guys, uh, they are not topological invariants. They depend heavily on smooth structure and on, on, on holomorphic structure of M and holomorphic structure on the bundle. So what uh, his group showed was that actually these are topological invariants because he, he really gave a formula for this in terms of something that was known to be topological. So, so here's the Brooklyn and Law is the following. This chi of M E integral over M. There is um, some. Um, so just to be, there is some churn class uh, of E we have to multiply by, but then before that, there is a top class. Yes, there is this R. Okay, of minus R10 divided by 2 pi I. Uh, okay, times red churn of uh, e yeah so this is the third class that we defined before and we were discussing characteristic classes and this is of course chain class i mean chain character sorry Um, actually, his book was not able to prove it in this generality. He could prove it only uh, for projected space, embeddings, uh, I mean, submanifolds of projective spaces. So, so this was uh, actually, he did it for and inside some CPM. So, projective smooth. Right, is. Uh, but then what that you see observe is that this actually is, is also a consequence of their theorem, but this actually is true in general. I mean, that, that works for any complex model. So at your singular, show that actually this is an index of an operator Go to index of an operator. And, and now this is more important. Here. And the right hand side follows from the index theorem. And on the right hand side is uh, follows from index theorem. Okay, so this was a big deal, right? Because uh, I mean, they, I mean, here's a group had it only for uh, sub varieties of complex projective space, but this is uh, in general. I, I believe in this case we need to have Keller manifolds actually. So I don't go into the definition because it needs to gain some, some, some discussions. So, but the question is, what is this operator? So the operator is a bit like Doran, but it's a kind of, if you want, it's a holomorphic Doran operator, because we are working in this case. So let me just write down this operator. Thanks of an, uh, of an operator. So what is this operator? So what you can do, you can look at this Durham C, first of all, you can decompose your uh, manifold into 
I mean, n forms on the manifold as direct sums of PQ forms. It was Q equal to n. Well, what is this uh, PQ forms? Well, I mean, there is a basis in terms of DZI and DZJ bar. Because of this holomorphic structure, there is a basis of one forms in terms of these things. So holomorphic, uh, not holomorphic, so PQ forms have P of this th these terms into the expression. And then had Q of this, uh, these guys. JQ, what? And of course, omega belonging to omega PQ is really sums of some coefficients here and then that's it. That's it. Okay, so we have this canonical decomposition because we have a holomorphic structure. This is independent of choice of complex uh, basis at that point. So this is canonically defined and this is it. Okay, so then what you can do, you can define this thing called, this was known already, the Olbo complex. Olbo complex with coefficients in E. So basically what you do, you just take this omega zero and star of M, you tensor it with, um, I mean, you tensor it with this bundle E with C infinity E. And there is this uh, Dolbo map, so this is the bar E. This goes from there into Omega zero. So let me put Q here, zero Q and tensor C infinity. Okay. So what is this del bar? You see this Doram D can be decomposed as del plus del bar. You see, I mean in, in one degree del is equal to one half. Dx. I mean, this is del z minus i d y, and del bar is equal to one half d d x plus i d d y. And so you can see that d can be written as sum of these two things. Okay, this is the dual to this decomposition. Um, so, like, this is on the level of vector fields, this is on the level of quantum. Anyhow, so you have this operator, and uh, you can show that actually uh, the this cohomology of this HQ of this Dolbo complex zero of and the coefficients on E, so let's call this whole thing like that. And this del bar, maybe E. Is actually uh, this, which are this check homology of uh, M with coefficients in OE. O Q, in this case Q. So now it's uh, clear that you can construct this uh, index, index of basically this E plus going from X sum. So let me put it like this, omega zero even of an E. So this is a little bit like Euler characteristic. It's a bit like Euler characteristic, but then uh, it's everything is holomorphic. So going to omega zero and odd of M and E, it uh, is equal to this arithmetic genus, chi. 
I mean, the idea again is to use Hodge theory that like, like we did for Euler characteristic. And then, so, I mean, this part is okay. But then the interesting calculation of uh, Atia Singer was that, uh, well, of course, this is just an example, was that indeed index of this, if you go through this mechanism of the their formulas, it, it delivers the right hand side of uh, Riemann rock. Okay, so that's the, the thing. Now, let me just give one special case which was known for a long time. So dimension of M equal to one. So this is a, I mean, complex manifold of dimension one. This is, this is the case of Riemann surfaces. And uh, E just a line bundle, polymorphic line bundle. So dimension of fiber is also one. I mean, holomorphic line model. Uh, in this case, uh, the result uh, shows that index of the E, the bar, which is really just D in this case also, but D E plus, if you want, or D V plus in this case, is equal to degree of. Now, D e minus, so let me put it like this, is equal to C1, integral of C1 of D e over M minus G plus one. Well, this G is the genus. Okay, so this result, not in this form, was known to Riemann, and it's this set, in fact, this is the classical Riemann rock. So link with classical Riemann rock. I'm gonna finish five minutes. Riemann rock. I mean, it, it, <laughs> Because in the classical Riemann rock, you don't have churn classes, you don't have line bundles, you don't have holomorphic. I mean, there is a holomorphic structure, which is the Riemann surface itself, but you don't have any of this modern technology. So, how this modern result relates to that? Well, I mean, that there's a very interesting thing to remember in this case is that these holomorphic line bundles are essentially divisors. In this case, uh, holomorphic line bundles. I mean, over a Riemann surface. Essentially, I mean, I'm not saying they are exactly the same as divisors, but essentially they are the same as divisors. I mean, there is some very close relation between the two. Let me give you one direction at least, how to go from left to right hand side. You see, if you have a holomorphic line bundle over your Riemann surface, if you can show that this line bundle admits a metamorphic section, pick a metamorphic section, you have to show that such a section exists and that's not very easy. Pick a metamorphic section. Yes. And then the divisor that you, you defined, B equal to divisor of S, is just sums of, you just subtract poles from zeros. So zeros, you give them positive, and then uh, poles, you give them negative weights. But remember uh, from first lecture, what is a divisor? Remember divisor on M is just uh, nothing but a bunch of points with weights. That's all. It's the free abelian group generated by the surface. So divisors on M, this is equal to free 
of even group is a huge group, infinite dimensional, uncountable dimensional, but that's okay. The Ovidian group generated by n, if you want, by the surface. So, bunch of zeros with multiplicity of zeros of the section. And now you might complain, what if I choose another section? It doesn't matter because this, if you go to the quotient, you get the same thing. Okay. So in the computations, uh, this, this is now very easy. So because this is equal to dimension of H zero of Me minus dimension of H one of Me. I mean, um, this is, you know, dimension of kernel minus dimension of co-kernel. And this is exactly co-kernel of this operator. You see, this del bar E goes from omega zero, zero E, I mean, M and E, to omega zero, one, M and E. And if you look at the, the definition of index, that's exactly this, uh, this thing. Okay, now you would say, okay, what is this space? This space is something that Riemann and Rock were very interested in actually. So let me just write it. Kernel of del bar, E means that we are dealing with holomorphic sections. So this is kernel of the bar E is equal to all the more exceptions. Not metamorphic, holomorphic sections. This space was denoted by uh, Riemann as uh, L of D. This D is the divisor that you have there. I remember from my first lecture, I don't expect you to remember, that's not fair to expect that. But I define L of D, remember, to be the set of all uh, metamorphic functions on, on M. Metamorphic. Such that. Um, this degree, I mean, divisor of F plus D is bigger than equal to zero. I mean, what does this mean? It means that if you are dealing with a zero, it means that the order of zero plus this degree of the divisor at that point, not degree, I mean, just divisor at that point has to be positive. And so this is a, this was the original definition by Riemann. Okay, so this uh, is not difficult to see. So then L of D, which is by definition equal to dimension of capital L of D, is equal to dimension of this. Uh, uh, I mean, okay, so this is this was the I mean, this is the definition. So I'm saying this is actually isomorphic to holomorphic sections. Sorry, I, I missed this point. Holomorphic sections. Of E. Sorry, this is going to pass now. So L of this dimension, the dimension of H zero of M. So this is this space. Okay. And with some work, which needs uh, non trivial result or cell duality, you can show that this is also dimension of H0. So, so let me just write it. Cell duality shows that uh, dimension of H1 of NE is actually equal to dimension, is equal to L of. K minus T. So this was canonical divisor. Uh, 
And um, what about the right hand side? The reason on the right hand side, integral of the first chain class of the bundle, I mean, E, sorry, or M. Well, this has a name. This is called degree of the divisor defined by, uh, by line bundle E. I mean, uh, degree of D, actually. This D is attached to, you remember, I said that there is a correspondence between D and E's. So this is attached to that. Sorry, I'm, but I'm here done. So, well, I mean, this is degree. What does it mean? It means that sigma D of X, X belonging to alpha. Okay, if you put everything together, so it looks like that uh, at your single theorem in dimension one, four holomorphic line bundle over Riemann surfaces and all these things, or here's a group Riemann rod, in fact, in this case, it shows that actually in this case, it's proof that LD minus L of K minus D is equal to degree of D minus G plus one. Now this G is the genus. This also has a uh, algebraic definition or holomorphic definition, this is equal to dimension of um, a space of holomorphic one forms on, um, so what is a good notation for this, I forgot. So this is a space dimension of holomorphic one form. Holomorphic one forms. So locally they are written as f of z dz, f is holomorphic locally, and dz is just one zero, means that so this is a space of such one forms. And this is the genus. This detects number of uh, genus. So this is, this was known to Riemann. This is definition actually is to Riemann. So this is the what, this, what, 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 what the result is proved, I mean, proves. So this was uh, done, uh, half of it was done by Riemann and then half of it by Locke. So together by, I believe 1860, they must have, I mean, the complete proof of this, I mean, in 1860s. So, but of course, his Riemann work is much more general, and at your single is much more general. Of course, there are a lot of details that has to be done, but this is the, I gave you just, um, okay guys, so the course is over. I'm glad to say that, I mean, we can go home.